guys uh, welcome back to the discussion salon if you're new here my name is paul and to the people who actually i've actually spoken to and to the people who have subscribed to my channel thank you so much for joining i still can't believe i've got a fan base really is i'm amazed and thank you all so much uh, yeah just thank you okay Firstly, a couple of apologies. I'd like to apologize for the time it's getting me to do this video. I've had a few personal problems I've which had to sort out. I've had to put some stuff. Uh, I've had to postpone some stuff too, and just a few, uh, just had a few personal problems. Also, I did promise this is going to be a location video. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Thing, my money situation has not been great, and I've only been able to do these things as a podcast for the minute until the money situation improves. I don't know how long it's going to be, but I do apologize. I can only do so much. Okay, so has anybody here ever heard of the expression, you'll get sweet Fanny, Fanny Adams off of me, or you'll get sweet fa from me mate i wondered what a strange expression where does it come from well i'm going to tell you and i'll tell you the tell behind it and it's a, just a sad 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 case it's a sad it's a sad story behind the saying so i'm going to take you back to victorian britain I'm going to take you back to the year 1867. It's going to be into. It's going to take you back to the Hampshire countryside, into a small place called Alton. Now, if you don't know if you've ever heard of Alton, Alton at this time was a relatively quiet, peaceful town. It was it was famous for its hop gardens and hop fields. It also was famous in Britain for its brewery too. There was a few breweries. They used to brew garlic. Um, who is that uh, Canadian company? Oh, Coors. Coors used to own the brewery there. Coors Molson used to own the brewery there. So, so now you used to make Carlin, I think. Carlin Lager, that's where you used to make it. So, that's my by the by. So, the, year, the day was the 24th of August, 1867. Three young girls were heading off to play. You had uh, the, the young girls' names were Fanny and Elizabeth Adams, or Lizzie, and then Mini Driver. Uh, no, Mini Driver, Mini Warner. Sorry, not Mini Driver. We're not, this is not Hollywood. So they all went off to play in the local meadows, which was only 400 yards away from their house. As they went off to go into the meadows, they came across a man. The, the man was indeed intoxicated. He was a bit. He was being. He was drunk. And as he came across the girls, you see them. He walked up to them and offered them three half pennies. He offered uh, Lizzie and Minnie two half pennies to go away, and he offered uh, Fanny a half a penny if she would accompany him where to where he was going. The two girls, uh, Lizzie and Minnie, took the money, and Fanny took the money, but she refused to. She refused. She refused to go with him. With that, he picked her up and carried her away. The two girls uh, apparently went off carried playing where they had to do it. So when they were coming back about five-ish, they were walking up where they lived, and one of the neighbours seen them. And I said, hey, where is Fanny? And they told them the tale that as they walked up, as they were walking to the meadow, they came across a place called the Hollow. Now, the Hollow led up to the, one of the nearby villages of Alton. And this man came from the direction of this Hollow, and he was well-dressed. He wore a black frock coat, a light, uh, a light waistcoat, trousers and a top hat and he offered them money this is got and then he 
when they took the money, he to then took Fanny and carried her away. Mrs. Um, Mrs. Gardner thought that's a really strange tale, and she rushed to go and get Fanny's mother, a Harriet Adams. And as she goes and gets goes goes off and tells that they're all getting worried, so go they're rushing over, and they go to the direction of the hollow, and they see the man as he was coming to coming back from there, and they question him. They go, "Where's?" Why did you give them? Why did you give my the three girls three pennies? And he said, "I didn't give them three pennies. I gave them three half pennies." And they said, "Well, where's Fanny?" And he said, "Well, I took Fanny with me. Then she later ran off and played go and tried to find her friends." I said, "Well, but why are you giving children money?" And he said, "Well." I always do that. If I see children playing, I go over and give them like little little bits of money, like a half penny there. Now, in today's society, that would be a bit very weird, but um, Victoria, Victorian Britain, not so much. And the women were quite impressed with his demeanour. They were quite impressed with the way he was dressed. And so they said to him, where do you work? And he said, well, I work in I'm a I'm a clerk and I work at one of the local solicitors in, solicitors in town. And they went, okay. So they said, if we, if we can't find the girls, we're going to come back for you. And he was like, all right. And uh, he walked away. And they walked back home. And it wasn't until like seven in the evening that both Harriet and her husband, George, started to get a bit worried now because Fanny had not returned home. So they went round the neighbours and the neighbours organised a search party. And um, as the search party started to look and they, they started to think it was a Thomas Gates who came across this child's bloody dress. And as he continued going forward, he came across a hop garden. And in this hop garden, where he said, where he actually said this, I came across the head of a child laying on two hop poles on the ground. The head was dirty and the eyes were gouged out. He also, he also seen body parts being scattered all among the hop garden there. And there came apparent to Gates that the body of the victim had been dissected by a murderer right on that spot. The sight was so horrific. It affected him so bad that he slumped to the ground, utterly distraught. I mean, I can't imagine finding body parts would be a good thing, but a child's body parts may just made him collapse. He, he was distraught. He just made him fall down and he was there. And Thomas was found in the same state by the local by one of the local police constables, a Thomas Light. And there was also an engine driver with him who was part of the search party, and he was a Charles White. They couldn't believe what they seen. It was something you just can't imagine. So Constable Light took control of the situation and instructed White to help to pick up the body parts and wrap them in a cloth and apron, then take them to a local pub called the Leather and Bottle, which is still there, but it's not a pub. It is on Emory Street in Alton. So if you ever go and visit Alton, you can see these places where I'm going to mention. And over the next few hours, more body parts were found and brought to the, over to the pub. Members of the search party went to inform Mrs. Adams and that they found the remains of young Fanny. Now, if I pause, sorry, it's me just getting affected by this because uh, it's just so sickening. And hearing of this news, she became frantic as any mother would. She, she, she rushed out to find her husband, George, who was playing cricket at the local butts. 
Now, the Butts is a small triang it's a triangular piece of land which is in the western entrance to Walton. It's originally used for archery practice, and it had an earlier name of Robin Hood Butts, so they shortened it to the Butts. So as she rushed off to go and tell her husband, she collapsed. She, couldn't, she collapsed with grief and shock and horror, and she had to be carried home by the neighbours. Several neighbours went to, which she went and informed the several neighbours that George was playing cricket at the butt, so she went. So the several neighbours went to the butts to break the horrific news to George, who then just, they had a little shock, and he rushed home, and when he got home, he got his shotgun, which was loaded, and looked for the killer, and the main suspect was a man called Frederick Barker, or Baker, sorry, Frederick Baker. So George went looking for him. It was lucky for Frederick that neighbours managed to calm George down. They managed to take his rifle, disarm, his, disarm him, take his rifle off him, and they stayed with him all through the night just to make sure that he'd done nothing like that to get it retribution now frederick baker was originally from a town called guildford uh, originally from a town town in surrey and the, the town's name is guildford which is only 20 miles away from alton and he'd only been in alton for that year he was employed by the local solicitor uh, william clement and um George, what happened on that that day that Frederick I'm sorry I'm just going through my notes here a uh, Frederick started to work at 10 p.m but according to his work colleagues Frederick looked like he had been drinking I won't question about this he confessed and said yeah yeah I've been drinking I've had been consuming beer and in the local at the one of the local pubs and it was one of the pub the pub he was drinking in was was sworn in and before starting work he had um only been working for now then he went off to the swan in again for another drink he took a fancy to the local barmaid and began flirting with her and uh then he made a clumsy drunken pass at her and tried to kiss at her you know, and whereupon the local landlady was like, whoa, 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 whoa. She was a bit surprised and questioned. She said, well, why would he start the day like this? And Baker replied, oh, never mind. You will not see me again. Baker returned to the office. Then later on, he returned to the swan an hour later, about 12.45, 1 p.m. with a Maurice fiddle. Now, I'm going to have to go back again. I should really do the editing, but... Okay, so... Frederick was in the inn drinking with um, with Maurice earlier that day, and both of them had left the swan. With Biddle returning to the office, and they could go into the nearby chemist to buy some scent. News of the... News of the body being found spread through Alton. Now, Alton is like, if you're an American, if you live in America, it's like it's just a small town, news spreads fast. Everybody knows that. So the news was spreading fast about the murder. So Biddle rushed over to the, to the chemist to confront the news to Frederick. And Frederick told George that a child was murd murdered. So Frederick said, oh, never more it's a bad job for me then. Let's go to the office and see if there's any truth in it. So both, uh, Fred, both Frederick and Biddle were returned to the office, and no sooner they returned, a uh, William uh, Doggerall, whose father owned the baker, one of the baker shops in Market Square in Alton, came rushing through the door, and he asked where Frederick was. And they said that he had murdered a child. Frederick stepped forward and denied the allegation. 
by this time, and a crowd started to perform round the solicitor's office. It was around nine in the evening when a superintendent, William Cheney, arrived at Clements, where he found a relaxed Frederick, a relaxed Frederick by, uh, Baker leaning against the desk, still wearing his top hat and smoking a cigar. He questioned Baker and asked him if he knew anything about the murder. Baker replied, Yes, and they say it was me, don't they? Cheney answered back and said, Yes, you are, sus you are suspected. The exchange between the two went on with Baker replying, I am innocent and willing to go where you like. Cheney asked if Baker had any knives about him. Baker produced two knives he was carrying. One had one was two bladed or double bladed, and the other were, had a was a triple bladed. Cheney examined the knives and found the larger blade of the double bladed knife had a slight blood smear at the edge of the knife. Cheney left a solicitor's office went to see Minnie Warner and Jane Gardner and thought they told him. He rushed back over to Clements and arrested Baker on the spot there and then for the suspicion of having murdered Fanny Adams. Baker repeated uh, his innocence and it was taken to local police station, which is located on the Butts Road, where he was stripped and searched. When Baker's clothes were examined, it was found that his left trouser leg, his left stocking, and his left boot were soaking wet, and his right trouser leg was damp. When questioned about this, Baker replied, Ah, that this proved nothing, as he had a habit of stepping in the water when he went out for a walk. But when Cheney was um, suspicious to this answer, and to him, the trouser leg looked like it had been recently washed, and in closer inspection of the clothes, there appeared to be spots of blood on them. Examining Frederick's shirt, it appeared that the left wristband was also had been more recently washed, and a further closer inspection, Cheney found more blood spots on, on the shirt. Questioning Baker about the blood spots, Baker could not explain on how or nor offered any explanation how they got there. Frederick was immediately placed in cell while in townhouse lanes, townhouse lane where Fanny, uh, where the Adams household lived. Neighbours kept Fanny's parents, George and Harriet, company as they struggled with what happened to the horror of it all. He just couldn't imagine, could you? And where, Ch over where Charles, also found Fanny's remains. More body parts were being found and taken to the leather and bottle. As the night started to draw in, the search party wound down for the night, and the constable Light had discovered had discovered the remains, placed on the sheet, and they were removed, taken to the police station, and they're placed in the police station's cart shed. The following Monday, the search party resumed and even more body parts and items of clothing were found and taken to the police station. Fanny's uh, velvet hat was found in the middle of a hedge. A William Walker was in the search party and he came across a slab of stone close to the post where Fanny, Fanny's remains were discovered. And a uh, closer, closer examination of the stone revealed that it was covered in blood. Long hair, it was covered in blood with long hairs and three lumps of flesh on the stone. So news of the murder began to spread and tourists st uh, started to travel autumn. It was quite easy to visit the crime scene because the, cr the hop gardens was only a short distance from the train station. So tour tourists walked to the crime scene and started to take souvenirs. Which, happened, which hampered the search and the, investigation, uh, the search party and the investigation too. But later during the day, a local physician, a Dr. Louis Leslie, started, started the green process of the post-mortem. Fanny, poor Fanny's body was cut up into 20 pieces. 
even the body, even still, some of the body parts were still missing. So Dr. Leslie reassembled the body parts as best as he could. The post-mortem showed that the cause of death had been a blow to the skull from a heavy object, which was quite possibly the stone that was found by William Walker. The dismemberment of the body had been carried out after death. Dr. Leslie concluded that the poor child would have died instantly from the blow to the head and would have suffered no pain or torture. When Dr. Leslie finished the post-mortem and piecing poor Fanny's body back together, it was only then later on that George Adams, Fanny's father, was brought to the police station where he had to go through the ordeal of identifying Fanny's body. There was plenty of witnesses who had seen Baker in the same area where Fanny's body was found. Some of these witnesses, one of them was a William James Walker, a whitesmith and bell hanger, had passed Baker at 1.30pm and Baker was walking across Walnut Tree Meadows, which is adjoined to Flood Meadows. Walker was struck and how vacant and glazed Baker looked. Um, it looked like he'd been uh, partially intoxicated. William Wal William Allwork, a cricket bat maker in the high street in autumn, had been crossing the flood meadows around 1.45 and he seen Baker leaning, toward, leaning against the gate. Further down the hill, William could see three children playing and he heard one of them shout, I'll tell your mother, Minnie. Then at 10 to 3, a Anne Marat met Baker as he walked from the hop garden towards St. Lawrence's Church. And she was struck by his civility as he opened the gate for her. And she noted there was nothing about his appearance that struck her in any way. The, so at two, two minutes past three, an under-shepherd, a George Noyce, was pretty pacific about the time because he he's one of the few people I had to watch. So Baker walking towards the hop gardens and Baker noticed George and proceeded to hide his hands under his coat skirts. Baker crossed the bridge and leading to the old Basingstock Road where Noyce said, um, Noyce seen Baker throw something into the river. A Mrs. Ann Porter was sitting at the door uh, at Flood Meadows Cottage when she seen Baker go past the garden and turn left along the road, heading towards Alton. She saw him around six o'clock. Then she seen him swoop down several times to do something to his trousers or boots. Now, one of the most important witnesses was a young seven-year-old, and his name was An uh, Alfred v v Vince, or Vines. And about five o'clock on that day of Fanny's death, he was standing by the gate in Townhouse Lane. And he saw a man come out of the hollow across, across Flood Meadows to the place where the boys used to bathe. Alfred described the man. Man's coat sleeves were turned back and his hands were red. Alfred watched the man wash his hands, then wipe them dry with a pocket handkerchief. And when the man noticed Alfred, the man began to run towards him, uh, which made Alfred run away to escape the man. But there was doubt cast on Alfred's witness statement, as he did not come forward until the inquest into Fanny's death and Baker's first court appearance. At Baker's trial in December, Alfred um, admitted that he had been taken to the Winchester Gale uh, for an identity parade by his mother. When he passed a man wearing a top hat, his mother nudged him. And when he stopped, he said, that's the man. It was early in the morning uh, of Monday, the 26th of August, that Frederick was taken before the local magistrate. The local magistrate's name was Edward Knight, and he was remanded in custody until the Thursday of that week. The press hearing about this case had reports and articles about the murder and reported that 
A great crowd of people turned up at the police station. The crowd was contained more women than men, and they were yelling and hooted at the at the prisoner most ferociously. That afternoon, a super, superintendent Cheney returned to Clement's office with a set of keys that he had taken from Frederick when he uh, searched him on that Saturday night. Cheney began to search the office, and when he came across Frederick's uh, uh, desk, there was a there was a drawer. So he used the keys to open the drawer, and he found a diary. Cheney went through the diary. And he's seen an entry made under the Saturday, the 24th of August. Uh, I will say most people will be maybe a little bit disturbed by this. And so on that, uh, on that entry, it was written. Killed a young girl. It was fine and hot. Cheney then took the diary to the station and showed Baker the, the, the entry where Frederick had admitted that he did write it. But he only wrote it after he had seen two women and um, that he did not mean to enter it like that. And yeah, he only wrote it because he was drunk. The inquest into young Fanny's death was held in the Duke's head which is now known as the Georgian Alton. So again, you can visit some of these places. So the inquest was held on the Tuesday, the 27th of August. And the Deputy Coroner for Hampshire, a Mr. Robert Harfield, presided the inquest. Frederick was brought from the police station in handcuffs a bit. An angry crowd where yells and... Other stuff were sh sh cried out from the crowd. I, can't, I don't think I'd be allowed to mention what they were probably saying. And he was taken to the Duke's head where he was placed on the sofa behind the deputy coroner. One of the local papers, a Hampshire Telegraph, reported on his appearance. The report said, He, he was somewhat slightly billed, and if his features were not pre-processing, they were no means repulsive. The report continued. He was naturally pale and his eyes were beginning singularly sparkling. And the anxiety which he manifests has rendered his appearance very careworn. And on, on that Tuesday afternoon, he was at times extremely nervous. So as the inquest went on, the crowd grew grew and grew and became more agitated and many of them pressed their faces up against the pub's windows trying to get a peek at Frederick and to find out what's going on. The deputy coroner, Harfield, warned the jury from what he from what he had heard and from what they have read in the press, they would have to listen and go very melancholy. But he thought it'd be better to say to say anything more not to say anything more about the inquest uh, but, but okay so i'm gonna start this again so the deputy coroner harfield warned the jury from what he had heard and from what they have read in the press they would have to listen very melancholy tell and he thought it'd be better not to say anything more before the inquest was go gone into the jury left and to view what remained of poor Fanny's body. And then when they returned, the inquest got underway. The first statement was from the young girl who was with Fanny at the time, Minnie Warner. And as she was questioned by the deputy coroner, he, she asked, he, asked, he asked her questions and what happened, and she looked around the room, unnerved by the crowd staring through the windows, and talked loudly that she was unable to identify Baker as the man. Fanny's father had to go to the inquest and he had to identify the victim as his daughter. The Morning Herald reported on this too and said, seemingly heartbroken, he gave his brief appearance in much grief. The afternoon hearing, Fanny's mother, Harriet, then testified to the events of that Saturday 
and her meeting with Baker on that day of Fanny's death. The inquest continued and more witnesses appeared and they gave their more they gave their accounts to the events leading to the finding of Fanny's body. The uh, following Jane Gardner the following Jane Gardner's evidence, the deputy coroner turned to Baker and told him that he thought it was only fair to allow him to question the witness, to which Baker replied, I have I have no question to ask. At present, thank you. The last witness uh, that day was a George Waters, and uh, and the, after he had been heard, the deputy coroner asked Baker if he would like to say anything. Uh, Baker replied, uh, no, sir, only that I'm innocent. Harfield then summed up the evidence after a brief deliberation, and the jury returned a verdict of willful murder against Frederick Baker for the murder of Fanny Adams. The crowd where the inquest was being held rapidly grew as numbers of farm workers who had been finished the work for the day went to see what was going on. After hearing the verdict, the crowd started to get more hostile and there were cries from the crowd calling for the lynching of Frederick. The police thought it would be best to keep the prisoner at, at the Duke's head until the crowd died down. After two hours of being struck, uh, stuck in a pub, the police tried to sneak Frederick out through the pub's back door and surrounded by police officers, he managed to get through the court gate, get him out the gate into the, to the courtyard and tried to get, get him to the police station. But a small group of spectators spotted the police, the police party and there was a cry of, there's the prisoner. And the angry mob surged towards the uh, towards them, hissing and shouting. The mob started to find stuff to throw, like sticks and stones and other objects that they could find at the police and Be Frederick. So that the police's party rushed and um, dashed towards the police station before they got hurt, and they successfully reached the safety of the station where Frederick was placed in a cell. And the next day, Fanny was laid to rest in Alton Cemetery. There was a large turnout for the funeral. Wreaths of flowers were placed on the coffin and later on the grave. A memorial stone was paid by, by the public and it was paid by public uh, subscription and it would later be erected over a grave. The stone was made by a father's employees, a J.H. and E. Dyer, who were local builders and bricklayers. Frederick was then transported to the Winchester Gale, uh, or Winchester Prison, where he was placed on trial. Now, apparently, even then, the police had problems bringing Frederick to Winchester because of what was happening, news spread. So there was an angry crowd waiting at Winchester train station, where police managed to navigate this by taking him down by cart. And that so there was no, there was no, there was only a few people hostile, hostile actions, as most of the people were waiting at the train station to lynch him. And um, he was placed on trial on the Thursday, the fifth of December, and that ended on the Friday, the sixth of December, where after twenty minutes of the jury being dismissed, they found the verdict and they pronounced him guilty. The judge donned his black cap and sentenced Frederick to be hung by the neck till you be dead. His execution was for the 24th of December, Christmas Eve. And on that morning of the 24th, Frederick dressed in his, uh, in his Clark's, Clark's garb and with his top hat before joining a hearty breakfast. A large crowd reportedly, several thousand thick, came to Winchester to see the execution. People come from Portsmouth, Southampton, and the working classes people of Winchester had been arriving. And people had been roaming through the night to go and see this man be sentenced, to be hung. Uh, and people were arriving there just to make sure they had a good, uh, good place to view this man. The Orchard Military Gazette 
which is another local paper, published an article about Baker's execution on this. They published the article on the Saturday, the 8th of December. Sorry. Ah, that's it. And the article said, at the hour fixed, he was brought out and conducted along the corridors and across the courtyard to the pinning room where he wore well brushed back hat and had been evidently rather attentive to his dressing. He walked steadily enough and while pensive he did not manifest any particular motion. Guarded by warders and followed by the hangman and those officials who were obliged to be present, he went unassisted up the stairs to a room where he was pinned while sitting in a chair. From hence, he went without help to the scaffold and took his place under the beam. Baker on the, stood on the drop until the hangman covered his face and secured the rope. Then, while left alone for several terrible moments to allow the, rev or the reverend or chaplain to finish his service, the wretched man quivered from head to foot. The warders stretched their hands out to support him, but as they did so, the bolt was drawn and the miserable culprit soon, to, soon ceased to exist. Now, it came to light that Frederick did make a full confession of this crime and he wrote a letter to Fanny's father asking for, for some forgiveness. And George reportedly sent him a consolatory um, message back. Now, what happened to Fanny's family um, when, after all this is done, both George and Harriet left Alton. They moved to London after working 20 odd years in London. Harriet passed away. George moved her back to Alton. Then he ended up in a workhouse. Uh, there was a public cry and people clubbed together to help him out. As he got helped out, he stayed with his daughter, Elizabeth, who, who recently got married. But saying that, he did die in the Farnham Workhouse in uh, 1908 on the 17th of February. I did try to find if there's any grave, but it uh, turns out there may not be one. There may be a pauper's grave he was into because it was from the workhouse. So that is a tale of Fanny Adams. Now, you can think it, how does that relate to Sweet F.A.? Okay, it's rather macabre one. If you're in the military or know the military, you know the military's got a sick sense of humour. So, in the eight, so in the late 1800s, the Royal Navy started to make its own canned beef, and they started issuing it out to sailors. The sailors found it rather unappealing and unappetizing and they started to liken it to fight to them finding Fanny's remains. So so sweet Fanny Adams would be a tin of beef. And they ended up calling the empty tins Fanny's because they reused them. And it wasn't till World War One that the British Army heard about this saying. So people, so soldiers in the British Army would hear say, Sweet Fanny Adams. And it, they changed it. I don't know how it got changed, but they changed it. They, they, they changed the expression to mean nothing. Or you can have the far ruder version of Sweet F.A. And it was used to refer to something or of anything or something of little or no value. So that's how you get. People saying, you get sweet Fanny Adams off of me or sweet F.A. off of me, mate. It's all to do about this young girl's murder and, um, 
and that's her place in history now just through an action of one man then through people using her name to mean nothing okay so always hate finishing i can never finish things properly so that is the case of fanny now if you ever go to walton a headstone is still in still in the cemetery it is a big headstone it is so she is remembered well through there these some of these places are still there so if you ever go if you ever end up in britain and you ever, ever visit hampshire you can always go and see, go to these places and see where these events happened i do have there is i do have a discord if you'd like to join the discord and also i do have a patreon too you can i'm not i'm not going to beg but there's a chance you could join the discord uh the patreon it's only five pound a month and there is a chance of winning a prize whether it be a book of literature of historic events or places or people or if i get enough there'll be chances to win some monetary prizes there so yeah i uh, like i say i don't know how to end these things so i'm never really good at this but okay so thank you all for listening if you'd like to do, join the dis discord and the patreon please do i'm not going to force force the issue it's also if you like hearing this please like and subscribe and peace with you and i hope you have a brilliant day and you'll take care of yourselves my name's paul and this is the discussion salon crimes and history and thank you all for listening you'll take care now goodbye <laughs>